It's been way too long since I uploaded an update about my little windowsill ecosphere that I started off back in mid-April, made by just filling up a jar with sediment and collected rainwater from the water butts in my garden. I promised you weekly updates, but that turned out to be quite hard to do, so let's put that right now by bringing everything completely up to date. So the project began on the 16th of April, and at the time of recording this, it's the 9th of July. Let's take a look at how the ecosphere looks from the outside right now. In the 12 weeks since starting, there's been a gradual increase of the amount of green that's visible inside the glass. Comprising a thin film of green algae lining the interior of the jar, and also a sort of mat of filamentous algae occupying about one third of the water volume. Interestingly, on the side furthest away from the light, If you've watched the previous episodes, you'll remember that from the time before we started seeing green algae in there, we'd already observed a thriving community of organisms inside. Including copepods, rotifers, and a multitude of probably single-celled life. From which we only really tentatively identified paramecium. Over the weeks that followed, I began to see more and more green algae growing. And at the start, this was just like peering into a forest. Except it was a forest with algae instead of trees, and rotifers instead of badgers. Vibrant, busy, and bustling with activity. Over time though, I saw fewer and fewer animals, and more and more algae. I can't honestly tell whether that represents a shift of population inside the jar, or if it's just that the filamentous algae now provides a habitat away from the glass, in an area where I can't focus my microscope. It also doesn't help that the other algae coating the glass makes it generally harder just to see inside. But there have been a few interesting things that I need to share with you. Mostly relating to the copepods, which are the largest of the animals that have appeared in the jar. Although, large is a relative term here, the largest of the copepods is about one millimetre in length, just visible to the naked eye. Firstly, there's this, which I initially took to be a different kind of organism altogether due to its different shape. Smaller specimens look like tiny mites or something. But I'm pretty sure this is the juvenile form of the copepods. Called a Nauplius, it turns out that I'm in good company mistaking this for a different organism, as that's what the prominent naturalists and zoologists all thought about them when they were first observed in the 18th century. Here and there amongst the strands of algae and the floating detritus, I began to see little silvery bubbles appearing. These might be methane developing from the decomposition of sediment, or they might be oxygen that's being produced by the green algae. Or perhaps more likely, a mix of those two things. Up at the surface, I often observe the copy pod swimming around and around a bubble like this. And it makes me wonder, are they doing this to get at the oxygen in the bubble? Or maybe it's because they tend to move about on surfaces and the bubble is just another surface. Who knows? And right up at the surface of the water inside the jar, there's also something interesting happening. Water inside a glass container typically lifts up a little bit at the point where it touches, as surface tension draws the water up into something called a meniscus. But here, inside the sealed jar, the headspace is very humid, and the inner glass is not very clean, so the meniscus fades into a thin film of water that extends all the way up to the lid. And in this thin film of water, algae grows, each little clump also causing the surface of the water to form a little bump creating this quite striking visual effect. And also, up into this thin film of water, the copepods will quite frequently swim, travelling what is for us only a couple of centimetres, but for them quite a considerable distance away from the main body of water. And so now we're drawing quite close to the end of our exploration of this tiny ecosphere. At least I think it's unlikely we'll see larger life forms emerging in there, or that we will observe different organisms without better microscopy. But I will keep this thing going here on the windowsill. After all, there's no reason not to, and perhaps we'll check in again at some point in the future. 
Before we go though, why don't we spend a few moments gazing again into that forest of algae, while we ponder exactly how it is that all this aquatic life found its way into the rainwater barrel in my garden. It can be easy to imagine that the copepods, rotifers and other organisms we saw here might only be found in large or permanent bodies of water such as ponds, lakes and rivers. But without going too deep into specifics, that's probably not true. These life forms will probably also be found in puddles, damp ditches, wet cavities in rotten wood, and so on. And in order to exploit those fleeting opportunities, these organisms have to be fast at breeding and development, and they have to have some way of surviving dry conditions. And that's what we find when we look at research others have done on these life forms. Copepods and rotifers lay eggs that are quite capable of surviving when all of the water in their little niche dries out. And given that these eggs are microscopically tiny and light, they can easily be carried around like dust, blown on the wind or on the feathers of birds, like sparrows that frequently take dust baths. Furthermore, some of these sorts of organisms are sufficiently robust that they can survive the digestive system of animals. So for example, copepod eggs ingested accidentally by a bird in one place might find themselves deposited in another place by the luckiest of shots. And the other thing that makes this likely is simply the rate and the scale of reproduction. Copepods may develop from eggs to breeding adults in just one week, at which point the females may produce 40 eggs or so, so it seems likely that during wetter spells there's probably quite a large population building up. And if only a fraction of this survives the drier spells, that's still enough to start over later or somewhere else. So that's all I have for you for now on this little windowsill ecosphere. I will be starting another one of these sometime, with materials sourced from other places. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again soon.